Hey folks, before we get started, I want to tell you about a new podcast from How Stuff Works and Jack O'Brien, the founder of Cracked.com and former host of the Cracked podcast. It's called The Daily Zeitgeist. Every weekday, Jack, his co-host Miles, and a team of comedy writers and journalists take you through the most important events driving the news cycle. They'll make you laugh while bringing you the most interesting stories and ideas hiding behind the headlines. As the name suggests, the show is daily and sporadically in German. Staying informed has never been as fun as it is on the Daily Zeitgeist. Go subscribe now wherever you get podcasts. That's the Daily Z E I T G E I S T Zeitgeist. Did I win? All right, let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking nears? What the fuck, nicks? What's happening? I am Mark Marin. This is my podcast. WTF, how's it going? Hey, here's a reminder to all of you in Los Angeles. We are doing our only L.A. book talk and signing this Sunday, October 29th at 7 p.m. That's it. One night only at the Ann and Jerry Moss Theater at the Herb Alpert Educational Village in Santa Monica. And if you haven't seen me and Brendan do our thing, you will enjoy it. We'll talk about waiting for the punch, but we also talk about behind the scenes stuff from the podcast. Some secrets that you don't know about. We take questions from the audience and we'll sign your stuff. Bring your copy of Waiting for the Punch if you already have one, or you can get one with your ticket. Go to LiveTalksLA.org to get tickets or go to the tour page of WTFPod.com. That's Sunday. October 29th, LiveTalksLA.org or WTFPod.com. Also, another thing, fans, friends, country people, uh, or global people, everybody, international friends. Uh, Brian R. Jones has a new batch of cat mugs. If you want to get a cat mug, just like the ones I give to my guests, go to BrianRJones.com to get yours. They go on sale today at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, and they always go very fast. So do that. I'll tweet that shit, too. Right? Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. Willem Dafoe is here today. Willem Dafoe. I talked, you know, it's hard when you talk to a guy about uh, acting and about a long career in acting. And uh, But uh, I I think we did all right, me and Willem. And he brought up a movie uh, called Light Sleeper, which is a, uh, a Schrader film, a Paul Schrader film who I'm a bit obsessed with sometimes, Paul Schrader, sort of a dark mind, dark masculine mind. That that autofocus man, he wrote Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, but we were talking about some other movie called Light Sleeper that I had not seen, and by some weird freak coincidence, this has happened a couple of times. Like, I'm on a plane. I usually fly American, and I usually fly business because I don't have children, I don't have a wife, I have some money. Can I spend it, please? Thanks. I'm giving to charity. You don't mind if I fly business, do you? So, yeah, so in their classic collection, or for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, Light Sleeper is there. I mean, there's a Paul Schrader film made in, like, 1992, and, uh, and I talked to him about it, and I'd never seen it before, and I watched it, and I just forget. I just forget that there was a tone to certain films. There's a tone to films that take their time. You know, some things are dated, but, you know, people who are auteurs who have a very specific uh, view, point of view for their films, an angle, and, you know, they're meticulous about what the script points are and what the story points are and what it's about. You know, sometimes it's it's not as satisfying as, you know, a, a movie that is fundamentally manipulative and i forget that there's a certain patience that you need to afford i don't know if i'd call it an art film but uh, an older independent film or any independent film that uh, you know maybe you, sh- you shouldn't judge too quickly also it's it's a 1992 film so the fashions and the tone of what's happening are are a, you know a little dated but i was surprised at who's in the damn movie Willem Dafoe plays this guy, John Latour, who's a drug dealer. Susan Sarandon is his main, you know, supplier. Dana Delaney plays this woman who was fucked up on drugs and used to go out with, uh, with, uh, Willem's character, but she got clean. And then he sort of is starting to run into her again. David Clennon, great character actor, is this other drug dealer. Mary Beth Hurt plays a psychic reader. Victor Garber, you know, the guy who designed the Titanic, uh, plays, um, 
this German uh, aristocrat, like wealthy drug dealer, weird sex guy. Sam Rockwell is in it for like two minutes. Jane Adams, a child, is in it as Dana Delaney's sister. And David Spade plays, his character is called Theological Cokehead. This guy's just jacked on coke and rambling on about God and metaphysics. It was just sort of odd to see it after. And I also watched the Meyerowitz stories, and I thought that Dustin Hoffman was great and Ben Stiller and uh, Adam Sandler. I'm just doing movie reviews, I guess. We're, uh, we're tremendous. You know, both, uh, you know, tormented, troubled Jewish men with uh, difficult fathers, I'm assuming, were able to really dig deep and make that, that fucking film, Noah Baumbach. Uh, it's his best, it's his best movie, no doubt. It's on Netflix. And if you want to see Dustin Hoffman, and he makes everybody run. Uh, Noah makes everybody run. And it's interesting because I like when that happens. Because, um, in The Graduate, Dustin Hoffman is a cross country runner for college. So, you know, there's a lot of him running in The Graduate. And he's got a very specific run. And I, and I can only assume that Noah was like, I wonder if he's still got that run in him. And, uh, and he did it. The same in like King of Comedy where, yeah, um, I don't know. Jerry Lewis must have been in his late fifties or sixties when you know, Scorsese had him in that movie, and he does a long scene where he's running from a fan, and it's just this crazy Jerry Lewis run. Uh, sometimes running is funny and and tragic, uh, just the activity of it. So, I, I think I feel like I just avoided telling you my shameful story. Um, do, do I need to? I, you know, I've been listening to a lot of music lately. I just listened to Little Steven and the Disciples of Soul record on vinyl. And then I want, I had to go back in and do a little more research on, uh, on Little Steven, you know, do with that information what you want. And then I found that he produced some, uh, of, not only did he produce, he was in the band, uh, you know, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. And then I listened to some of that on my Sono system. All over my house, I had Southside Johnny. And I got to tell you, everything sounds great in my house because I have Sonos speakers in pretty much every room, the living room, the bedroom, the kitchen, even out here in the garage. It's perfect. My whole house is filled with music whenever I want. Sonos lets you have pulse-pounding sound in any room or every room at once. That's right. You can play a different song in the living room, bedroom, bathroom, or the same track in every room. And you can use all your existing music services or discover something new, whether curated or on-demand, free, or subscription-based, Sonos has you covered with access to a growing list of musical services. Plus, Sonos' simple app lets you control everything from songs to volume to rooms all in one place. And now Sonos is offering WTF listeners 10% off one order of $2,500 or less for any product on Sonos.com. This offer is available for a limited time only and cannot be combined with other discounts or promotions. Use the promo code WTF10, that's capital WTF10, at Sonos.com to receive this offer. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll tell you about my shame because maybe it will, uh, maybe it will help others. But wait, but wait, before I do that, let's, let's share a couple of emails of success stories. Subject line, thanks to you and Nikki Glazer. Mark and Nikki, with Mark's new book out, I thought I would share a moment that had a big impact on me. I am in my mid-40s, was struggling with a marriage that was falling apart, feelings of guilt about my issues as a parent, looking to infidelity to provide a quick fix and make me feel better, but only feeling worse, and finally, secretly going to a therapist then struggling to really understand what was happening. My wife started joining me in therapy in hopes that if we could get to the root of my problems, we could get to the root of our problems. But I was not digging in, not trying to really understand why I was the way I was. Then Nikki flipped my world upside down. Quote, maybe your mom doesn't love you, unquote. And the next 10 minutes of the interview on the WTF podcast, Nikki opened my eyes to what it meant to be truly honest with yourself, to be okay thinking those things about your parents who are supposed to love you and confront them head on. And now those things affect everything and everyone around you. I had heard Mark talk about parents with others, but Nikki was so direct, so brave. It was the first time in my life my walls came down. I was honest with myself. I was honest with my wife and kids. I accepted my parents for who they are and changed my approach to dealing with them. 
My marriage is so much better now. We talk about difficult things. We listen to each other, and we are better parents and fixing some of the mistakes we made along the way. This wouldn't have happened if I didn't fundamentally change what I was doing. In that moment, listening to Nikki was the jolt of reality I needed, like she was talking directly to me. I've probably listened to that part of the interview 10 times since the first time, usually when I'm having doubts about myself or feeling guilty after talking with my parents. It gives me the confidence to be true to myself, to trust my feelings. I wanted to thank you and let you know there is a special place in my heart for both of you. Sincerest thanks, Todd. Hey, man. Glad to help out, and I will tell Nikki. I will I will give this to Nikki. I will show Nikki. Here we go. Subject line. Hi, Doctor of Cocaine Studies, Marin. Last time I sent you an email, I was around 10 days sober. It's been about 90 days now without pulling up a bottle and having a chair. And damn it, I feel great. I went from living with my parents, barely maintaining any semblance of life, to having my own bottom floor in an estate house, going back to school and working. WTF. Please, talking sobriety with your guests. It always helps to know that everyone goes through shit and either maintains, burns out, or chooses sobriety. Talking matters. Simon. All right, so there you go. Those are happy stories. So, okay, I'll tell you. There were a few guys working on the house, all right? There were a few guys working on the house, and I um, and I had to split. So my, you know, I got a guy who works for me occasionally, Frank. He was going to come over and hang out while the dudes finished up the, uh, the hammering and sawing and the dude stuff outside. Yeah, I could do it. Of course I could do it, but I, you know, I, I didn't have time. And, you know, we, they're pros. They're pros doing some repair work on the home. So what happens is, you know, they're out there working and um, Frank comes over. Now I look the way I do. Frank looks the way he does. Frank's got a, a mustache as well and he's wearing shorts. He's got glasses and, you know, I got my mustache and I got glasses and I'm not wearing shorts, but I got my boots on and, you know, and I'm like, I don't know when they're going to be here till. And I would already talked to him, you know, to see, you know, to tell him they were doing a good job and find out what they were doing. And, and then uh, Frank goes, all right, I'll, I'll just go ask him. So he goes out and asks him. And then we're both sort of standing outside. And then I take off and I tell Frank, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And then, uh, you know, the uh, I say say goodbye to the guys working there. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you know where this is going, but uh, I, I wasn't happy about it. But, you know, I drove away thinking like, man, those guys, all those guys, those guys out front, they they think I'm gay. They think me and Frank live in that house together and we're lovers and we're just gay as as gay can be. And I don't know why it affected me, but my next thought, and, and this was, there was a couple of things that happened in my brain and, and I don't know what it indicates about me. Um, but like I thought, well, if they think I'm gay, they're going to fuck my house up somehow. But, okay, so then, then I'm in this zone of like, well, this is probably how gay people feel a lot in terms of being judged. Now, I don't know if these guys thought anything. I'm making all this up in my head. I don't I I think I'm not I don't believe I'm homophobic unless it's me who's gay. And I'm not gay, but I was homophobic because I was scared of people thinking I was gay and what they would do. And I imagine that is some sort of twisted empathy, but the sad part is I sort of had to struggle with you know it was it wasn't going to happen, but like with you know driving back and somehow declaring to these three guys who are working on my house who might not be thinking anything that I wasn't gay for some reason, uh, just so they wouldn't fuck up my house and they would think that, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, it just, it, it, that, see, that's the tricky part. That's the shameful part. I did not, you know, drive back to my house and stand out in front where the guys were working going, hey, you know, I, got, I have a girlfriend, all right, so it's not what you're thinking. I just sort of sat with the reality. It's like, yeah, I'm okay being gay. I'm okay if me and Frank are gay to those guys. I accepted it. I, I came out to myself in that moment in, in terms of what those other people were thinking. I went through a lot. I went through a lot in that few minutes driving away from the work being done on my house. All right, so Willem Dafoe is in this beautiful new movie called The Florida Project. Uh, it's now playing. There's a lot of Oscar buzz for his performance. I saw it, and I thought it was spectacular. The director, Sean Baker did another film that I did not see. I think it was called Tangerine, and I was sort of poo-pooed it because I was like, it was too much buzz about it. It was shot on an iPhone, and I was like, I'm not buying in. Everyone said it was good. People I respected said it was good, but I'm a, I'm a dick. So I got to see that now because this was sort of a, a pretty astounding movie. Uh, Defoe plays a, a, a hotel manager, and this is a 
not even an extended stay hotel, just a shitty hotel near uh, the Orlando theme parks. And people are living there. You know, low income, poor people are 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 living at this shitty hotel. And there's a, a sort of a whole little community and ecosystem to it. It did. It felt like um, it was weird because the tone of it. You know, this guy Baker shoots very sort of from the hip and you know handheld and uh, it's gritty. But the, it had this tone because there's a lot of focus on the kids in this film. And I'm like, well, now we've got our own third world right here in this country of, uh, of street children and of people that live in a compromised situation. Obviously they've always been here, but this really shines into the, the tragedy of having to parent and exist in these conditions, but also this sort of relentless joy and, and sort of detachment that children have despite the circumstances. There's a tremendous balance in the film. Uh, and me and, and Willem talk about that, among other things. This is me and Willem Dafoe. You were the last of eight. I I have a younger sister, seventh seventh of eight. So you were so you're the seventh of eight. Yeah, seventh son. <laughs> Five <laughs> sisters, two brothers. No. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my God! Do you know them all? <laughs> uh, do I know them all? You mean like, well, <laughs> I know their names. I know their names. <laughs> but no, I guess it's weird. And my parents used to call me, call anyone. Yeah. They were like, it was like, Barbara Nancy B.D. Dodd and Dick, really? They'd do the whole run. <laughs> they and, had to, I guess. And everybody's ears perked up, and so they you, had to kind of intuit which one they really were wanting. <laughs> my, my mother did that with animals. There were several dogs okay. and a couple cats. So you know the thing. It's a little insulting, though, with the animals. I mean, you should know the difference. It's not insulting for people? <laughs> <laughs> well, you should know the basic difference between a pet and a child. I but, don't know that difference. <laughs> I haven't had enough pets. No. <laughs> so... Oh, my God. So, like, you really probably didn't really know your older siblings that well, right? I didn't. But they raised me. They did? Yeah. I mean, I remember I was... Some of my early memories are, you know, my sister, my oldest, eldest sister going off to college. I was probably... I was probably six. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. That's sad, man. It it must be sort of... No, but also... You saw them all go. That's okay. Because (laughs) uh, they also... All, a lot of them, for undergrad anyway, went to the University of Wisconsin, and that was in the 1960s. So when I became a teenager, yeah. I used to hitchhike down there, and I had some of my best experience, most formative experiences on that University of Wisconsin Madison campus as a adolescent. Oh yeah, hanging out with my, you know, sure. Uh, uh, couch surfing uh, with, your with my brothers and sisters. Yeah, because they all went there. Seven out of eight, yeah. I'm the only one that didn't, actually. And that's uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. And, and that was a lively campus, you know, up with Berkeley and uh, right. some other places. There was a lot of activity. And you were like 16, 17? Yeah, you know. No, no. I first started going there when I was like, you know, 14, 15. Uh, oh, yeah. wow. Because it was only 100 miles away. And it's a great Take town. I've been to down. that town. Yeah, it's a and hip the, town. Yeah. And it was, you know, and it was interesting, too, because... You know, kind of growing up in Wisconsin with kind of good, well-educated Eisenhower era, you know, Republican parents. Right. And then through my, <laughs> see my brothers and sisters get radicalized through their going out in the world. And yeah. I think that had a big effect on me. Well, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people about that. It's necessary, I mean, to have, if you don't have older siblings, to, to guide you one way or the other into the light yeah. of... Uh, of what is interesting and cool, uh, you might be hobbled. Yeah. Or or you may see there's another world out there a little too late. That Right, right. You missed it. But, but then again, sometimes you see people that grow up in a little town, and they can develop in a very full way. You know, oh, just sure. Because sure, yeah, they'll develop, but like at that time... Right, you know, you're. I mean, everything's blowing up. The whole social fabric yep. is coming unglued. Yep. Music, art, yep. you know, the power of uh, of creativity. Yep. So you were just you, you were able to sort of like go see that yep. as a it's fifteen true. year old. It's true. And and what do you remember most about what was inspiring? 
Well, just a kind of um, questioning yeah, and right. protest. And right. also, also, I remember, if this is a kind of funny connection, but I think one of the things that made me start, I started making, you know, working with a uh, small avant-garde theater company. That, that was really what, uh, you know, started me as an actor. In and Wisconsin? continued for many years. Started in Wisconsin, but then more notably in, uh, in, in, uh, in New York and with the Wooster Group. Right. But all, but, but like that stuff in Wisconsin, was it like, uh, you that must've... was, well, it was, it was, it was avant garde in the respect that we were doing different forms. It was still, we were basically working with a playwright and we were still working with, you know, uh, the literature yeah, of, sure. of, of making plays, but they were, the subject matter was radical and the stagings were radical. And we were a, you know, collective of people that ran a little factory space and did everything ourselves. So in, in, that was a new form. So, so. In what town? Uh, Milwaukee. So that, so briefly, that, briefly. That was for like a couple of years, but it was important. Now, do, your parents, like, what did your old man do? Uh, he was a surgeon. Oh, my dad was a surgeon. Yeah. So never home. <laughs> never home and my mother worked with him and she was a nurse and she'd she she'd do you know he had a clinic and he'd do the lab work and uh-huh because they they were in the center of a of a kind of agricultural community yeah you yeah know, it was a town of fifty thousand. that was kind of the hub so people would come from far away to have their visits with yeah. him what type of surgeon he was a gastrointestinal surgeon. Oh, okay. Very well trained, Harvard Medical School, Mayo Clinic, you know. But he was a far, you know, he's a country boy, so he really wanted to practice in uh-huh. Wisconsin, you know. Uh-huh. So these people would come from far away. He'd get called out for surgery, and my mother would be working the desk sometimes, having to, you know, calm these people down because they'd travel from far away <laughs> yeah. and they, they didn't want to leave, so they'd have to wait when he was called out on emergency surgery. Sure. And I'd be there sometimes doing, well, I, I worked as a janitor there, but also I used to do school work there sometimes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I'd hear these people cuss out my mother and she'd take abuse all day. <laughs> and then my father was come in, would come in like he was Jesus Christ. You yeah. know? And they were like, oh, doctor. And they'd give my mother a dirty look and then they'd have their visit and everything was nice again. <laughs> And I always felt bad for my mother because she really took, took the hit. that took a huge bullet for this guy to play to God. play the hero. Yeah, sure. and that was very much the era where you know, doctors were were yeah. the word you bigger know? than life. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, and he was a good guy. He wasn't a jerk, and I think he was a he was a you know very moral and uh, probably a good doctor too. But, oh yeah. But still, to see that growing up really blew oh, yeah, my mind. Yeah, yeah. To, the reverence and the and the sort of dismissal of uh, of your mom. Yeah, and and you know, kind of. Yeah, yeah. The service, the sexism. There yeah. were lots of stuff in that. Oh yeah. <laughs> but you got along with him and her. Yeah, both. Uh, uh, probably better him than her because it was one of those stories that we were probably too much alike. So she. She would bust my balls a little bit. Where yeah. he was probably more distant. It was more a symbolic relationship, but he was very, he was actually, he was a disciplinarian and rigid, but we respected each other. So oh. there was a distance, but I, there's something, I, I love both of them and had no problems. Well, that's great. And then are you the only, I'd fight with her a lot though. Yeah. Well, you got to fight with one of them. Yeah. Cause she tried to be a, I think she tried to be a super mom uh-huh. before those things were happening she uh-huh. was a working woman sometimes she was going to school even and she was and she had all these kids but you know i just want to say man forget it just yeah. give up on the mother thing yeah. you know do one thing or the other because <laughs> you're spreading yourself too thin uh-huh and just face it so don't pretend like you're everywhere at the same time oh right you know let us go Oh, I see. So a lot of the fights were like, you're not around. Uh, well, for it my, was like, yeah. it was like, you know, you'd go someplace and I'd say, I'll take, I'll get a ride home with someone. Yeah. And, and in order to be sweet and to try to be a good mother, she'd say, no, I'll pick you up. Yeah. And then she'd forget. Oh. And I'd say, then I'd walk home and she'd say, I'd say, where were you? And she'd say, oh, oh man. Right. Oh man! And then next time it would happen, I'd say, "Hey, it's okay. I'll take right. No, no, I'll pick you up." And it happened again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was what it you unloaded. Abandonment <laughs> issues. <laughs> Perfect for an actor, right? Yeah, is it? I, I guess it is. I don't know. I don't know. 
I, well, I, you, boy, we're we're up and close pers- and personal. I, I must have woke up on the uh, on the open side of the on bed. the confessional <laughs> side of the bed. Well, did, were you the only one that went into like a creative pursuit? No, they're all they're all like in, in I mean, strictly an artist. Um, I I would no well. Hmm. They're all professional people, but they're all more talented than I am. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, come on. No, but, no, they are. You know, yeah. when we get together, they all sing better, they all dance better, they all laugh better. <laughs> but I've, I've got a tenacity they don't have. <laughs> you stuck it. You stuck with it. You made no, the life out of it. Something like that. They, they're hobbyists. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but yeah. it's really funny that. No, they're they're. I mean, I, I guess I, I tip my hand that way because I don't want to make it sound like I come from this family of oh, right, you know yeah, of yeah. striving uh, professional people right. and I'm the artist. Right. It's not true. They yeah. were all and they are all creative people. My my brother the surgeon, you know, uh, plays uh, music. Uh my brother the lawyer is very clever storyteller. Yeah. My one of my sisters the nurse. Yeah. Uh, she draws beautifully and, uh, yeah. and writes uh, beautifully. You know, it's yeah. like that. No, I do. I do know what you mean. It, it's just that they they were smart enough not to make it a living. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. But I. What'd you get? Was willing to yeah, roll, roll the dice. dice, and I made. Got what did I get? Lucky seven. seven. You got it. God damn. Yeah. So all right, so you okay? So this is fascinating to me. So you know, you, when you started acting in high school, uh, even before that, there was a community theater in my. There was a university called Lawrence University where I was, and it was a private, good school. Yeah, and they had a very good drama department, a very good physical space. Yeah, and in the summertime, some community people got together because it was a place of means because there were these paper mill factories yeah. and uh, uh, paper mills and there was some yeah. there was some wealth there some money around yeah the, and they made a um uh summer theater and they uh hired you know a director from New York to come for the season and direct you know plays. and you were, and you were how old the first one I did probably was I was probably 11 so you were basically trained as a kid by just being in the play yeah, yeah. you know it it changes yeah. but yeah and in school plays, and you know, like a lot of kids when I was little, I used to write plays. You did, I, yeah, yeah. They, they were always that. historic things. Oh, really? Like titles like Cortez <laughs> or or <laughs> the Alaska Gold Rush. They were very short. Uh-huh. I always wanted to do the action stuff, and but couldn't ever quite beef up the dialogue, you know, because I wasn't really interested in the psychology. Yeah. I was interested in the. Uh, the doing, yeah, sure. Being the, the doing, in. not the showing. Yeah, yeah. Which came a cropper later. Yeah, they, but do you, you didn't have you done a lot of writing in your life or not really? No, not, not really. really. I mean, no, no, not really. So I mean, after, so after the experimental theater in Milwaukee, like you know, after doing, like you, you know, I would imagine that once you finished high school, you kind of committed to it. Not really. No? What happened is, I I left high school early. And yeah, I was kind of in between things. Didn't know quite quite what to do we yeah. considered joining the army as weird as really that and this is in the mid 60s or late 60s no 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 hey, i'm not 80 guys <laughs> <laughs> this is this is 72 okay oh, 73 sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. um you know i just knew there was another world out of there and uh, out there and yeah. i wanted to find it you know yeah yeah um so i Oof, started taking sorry. classes at university where and, in madison and no in milwaukee okay because i had a uh, brother-in-law uh-huh. or a brother in future brother-in-law to be that was there and I stayed at his place and started taking courses and being in plays and then these people from this theater theater X saw me in that and said you, you forget school come come work with us and be I did for a little, yeah a little bit <laughs> yeah then I did that for a little while. We got picked up by a European producer, so it was exciting because I was like 18 years old and and traveling in Europe with these shows and things. And I was seeing all these shows from around the world, particularly at a place called The Mickery in Amsterdam, which mm. was very well funded with a real visionary producer who would go all around the world and select things and huh. just bring them. To his like, theater. Like, like what, what type of stuff? Oh, 
everything from spectacle to you know African dance to uh, right opera to you know yeah yeah it was a flexible space a modest space um, you know his taste was more toward the avant garde uh, not traditional theater mm -hmm. but you never knew with this guy um, and you're just taking it in and I'm just taking it in yeah and and, and turned on and yeah. seeing seeing really kind of great performers and really interesting people and i think that's when you're that at that age you want to be with inspiring people cool people yeah. people that are kind of supporting this new education you're having sure so you know i go from middle class secure guy from a big family with you know kind of a track laid ahead of me that I should be yeah f follow right. the tradition yeah and then I enjoy probably because somewhere I have that security in my head you know yeah. falling about two social classes and being you know living in a poor neighborhood and knowing people with drug problems sure. and, and criminal records uh -huh. and uh, you know yeah. poverty and you know I always think of the uh, Bob Dylan line, you know, a little boy lost, he takes himself so seriously, yeah. he brags of his misery, loves to div live dangerously. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, yeah. that was me. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's you want to get dirty. Sure, of course. You want to get I, dirty. I, I can relate to that. Because dirty feels real. Yeah, I can relate to that. That's absolutely right. You, so, you so, didn't come upon it authentically, but you could, you could visit it. You were reaching. You, yeah. knew, you knew there was something there. Yeah. And you wanted to know the other narrative. Mm hmm. Because you were up to here with the narrative that was fed to you, yeah, by all the, yeah, you know, the culture that you were living. Sure, in. and you could see where that was going, yeah. and what it expected of you. Yes, this. yeah, yes. So that's where we are. And then I, I just felt I loved the people at Theater X, but I, I, I had an ambition. Yeah, and I really then moved to New York. I think to be a traditional theater actor. Also, I thought, you know, this acting thing, I like it. Yeah, and if I'm going to have do something i better you know get get prepare. serious yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and go to mecca yeah but at the same time i was reading about bob wilson i was reading about richard foreman i was reading oh, about foreman i forgot about those plays i worked with him oh yo, my god he used to do a play like every month oh he's he's a great artist. a lot of things going on yeah it's yeah amazing. beautiful yeah yeah, beautiful. yeah amazing. He, he is pure theater to yeah me. yeah um so is bob wilson in a very different way. Bob Wilson with the, the ladders and the sparse and the minimalism and the operas and the... He does lots of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But no, I like him. I've worked I, with I, both I, of them. I didn't mean to trivialize. No, oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, I just remember ladders. They're like, I've always seen it a few productions. He's, he's got a language. <laughs> okay. Uh, seriously, I like and him. He, and like he uses him. that language. Yeah, I get it. And that's part of the pleasure. Yeah, I think I, I saw recently, I, he did an opera, didn't he, at Lincoln Center? I think uh, in the last He does year. many things. Yeah. I worked with him recently. I did two shows, uh, Life and Death of Marina Abramovich, and also, which was about Marina Abramovich. She was in it, and yeah. also Anthony Hegarty, uh -huh. uh, now Anoni, uh, did the music. It was a beautiful show. Uh -huh. And another show, uh, just a two-hander with uh, uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov and myself, um, Called the old woman, based uh -huh. on a, a, a Russian writer. And you did that work. recently? Yeah, recently. It's great. We even did it at Royce Hall, which wasn't the perfect uh, venue for it, uh -huh. but uh, we were happy to bring it to LA. We toured a lot, but very little in America, which always frustrates me because there's not the money or, or right. really the interest. I think. No, I, I, it is. Uh, yeah, the avant-garde stuff or stuff that's provocative and hard to understand seems to do better elsewhere. <laughs> Well, as far as theater, yes. Yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, so you what? Are you, what are we talking? Like seventy three, seventy four? You go to New York? We're talking. Uh, no, we're talking. I do my little stint in university in seventy three, seventy four. Yeah. Then I'm with Theater X till I try to move to New York. Theater X calls me back to the Midwest, and then I go to Europe with them, and then uh, with about, one production or no just, several. Uh, seventy seven, I'm in New York for good. And I'm intending to be a traditional theater actor. Yeah. But I'm looking around, and I keep on finding myself going downtown. Uh -huh. And I keep on finding myself, you know, seeking out those people I'm reading about. 77, uh, so it's all still there. It's all still there. It's yeah. kind of on the wane a little yeah. bit, you know, and also other things like punk 
has happened. Yeah. It's starting to happen, but it's still going on. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, the you can still see the Ramones at CBGB's. In 77, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're seeing, you can see television. Yeah. You, you, you can, right. You might go to a party and, you know. Warhol's David still around. David Byrne may get, yeah. get up and do something. Uh-huh. So there was a lot going on. Yeah. And that's, that felt like what was happening rather than going around and getting a waiter job and, and you know. Auditioning for Broadway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was all, that was that was kind of a throwback for me. That's what when I the only thing I could imagine until I knew the other world. Uh-huh. So then I get introduced to that world, and I'm a square kid from Wisconsin. But you have a little, uh, you have a little uh, uh, avant garde Bonafides from sure, 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 sure. Know. But that that not the nickel real thing. won't get you on the subway, you know. <laughs> um, so Where I'm there, and then I run into I, I basically am. I just find myself being attracted to downtown, and yeah. I run. I see the work of the Worcester Group, and I basically um, say, "I want to work with you guys." How many are there? Me. Who's in that? How do we, like? I thought you. I thought you were uh, one of the guys who started it. Yeah, well, the, it 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 was born out of another group. Yeah, which called, was called the called Performance the, Group. And who was the who was uh, the that? Guy? Was Richard Schechner. And then he, people that worked with him. Yeah, and that was started in like '67. Old school. Old school, not, no, but no, uh, old school avant garde. Right, right. You know, nudity, I mean. yeah. uh, 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 confronting the audience, kind of a little bit in more in the living theater tradition. Like Julian Beck? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not the same thing. I shouldn't say that, but just for your audience, maybe that, that broads. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's not it's not regular place. Right. It's, it's in and, the world of the avant garde. Yeah. yeah. And it's political. Yeah. Okay. So. I st- start with Richard, yeah. and then there's a group within the group that becomes the Wooster Group. Uh, the Mutiny. And that's led by Elizabeth LeCompte, and the principal uh, principal uh, other person is uh, Spalding Gray, also Ron Vauder, oh, Libby yeah. Howes, Jim Clayburg. It's, it's a group of people, and they start to make work as a sidebar to Richard. Uh-huh. And soon, all the energy, all the resources, and all the interest kind of shifted to them and uh and also i love. fell in love with uh liz lecompte the director uh-huh. so my interest and resources and everything <laughs> shifted to her so like the dirty turncoat rat i am yeah i i started hanging out with them yeah and then uh then spalding in, invited me to be in the next piece, and that's then I started working with them in a run that lasted twenty seven years. What was that piece? That piece was probably the first one I did was Nay at school, but the first substantial one uh where you know I was really yeah a a principal performer and maker was um Point Judith. What was a signature, like, you know, because I've seen Spalding Gray several times before he died, and right. I've seen you work. Uh, not, I don't think I've seen you on stage. I feel like I've been to the Worcester Group once, but what was, what was the, you know, uh, what was emblematic of the, of the Worcester Group's work? Well, you know, people use a, kind of a misnomer. They talk a lot about deconstruction because mm-hmm. sometimes we would use a text like a, a classic American play or yeah. some text, sure. and we would use it as a thing, play with it, mm-hmm. um, to kind of uh, deal with it in our own terms. I- improvise with it? No. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes we'd change things. Sometimes yeah. we'd, we'd cut things. Yeah. Um, there was that. It was also a very physical approach. It was very architectural approach because... Uh, the first thing the director started out with, Liz, was always the space. Uh-huh. She thought very spatially, very visually, very architecturally. Uh-huh. And uh, then she would bring in a text or someone would bring in a text and we'd play with it. We'd find a way to put it on its feet. And sometimes we'd cut it radically. Sometimes we'd change it. Sometimes we'd lay something over it. Uh-huh. And then also another thing that I think people was new sort of that we were doing is we were incorporating a lot of uh, sound and video stuff right. in kind of non, you know. In, traditional, non-traditional well, they, ways. They, we weren't hiding it. Right. 
I mean, uh, one easy example comes to mind. In one show, we had a 93-year-old woman, uh, you know, in the show. Yeah. Uh, she couldn't make it all the time. So we put her on tape, and we'd wheel out a TV, and we'd play the scene with her <laughs> on tape. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the crudest thing possible. But we were using this technology in a practical way. Yeah. And then... With time, it came, became more uh, sophisticated and aestheticized, and then even further uh, developed now, because they continue to work, they do a lot with ghosting and playing with a mix of tracks outside uh -huh. that are guiding them, and they're performing riffing off the track that's either in their ears uh -huh. or they have a visual reference for it. Oh, that's trippy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a very dense um, performance style. Yeah. It was beautiful work. I haven't seen it lately because I haven't been around. But you worked with them for like 26 years. Yeah. On and off. And I, I think I remember when... I it, was it is it possible that they get a new space in the late 80s or... or no. We, well, we had this small space right. called the Performing Garage. Yeah. That still exists. Yeah. But I think as the technology grew, the playing space got smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, oh, the other thing that I f forgot to mention yeah. is it was a real company. Yeah. The people were working there every day. Yeah. And that gave us the ability to show things in progress. And it also gave us the ability to bring back old shows and put them next to new shows. Uh -huh. So it was a real, it was about a whole fabric of work. It wasn't just knocking off doing shows. Right. It was a, about a whole body of work. And they kind of had conversations with each other. Right. And that was beautiful for anyone that was really followed the company for a long time. It was its own world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we uh, we had a space called the Performing Garage. Yeah. And it, it got kind of small. Mm -hmm. And economically, it became very difficult. Yeah. Because... Uh, we wanted to keep our ticket prices reasonable. Um, we made our bread and butter through international touring. Uh, but even now, I think it's a struggle. And, yeah. and, and through corporate, you know, Support. giving. Yeah. yeah. But, um, it, it's, it was a struggle. And but there's a new space I'm now. At, it's not just a garage. No, they it's have still? the garage, but they, they do perform at Barishnikov space. Oh, okay. They have. They have. Yeah. And they have also performed in, at St. Anne's. Oh, they do residency like? Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. That was, I stopped working with them in, like in 2003, which is quite a long, long time ago. Has, but, yeah. they, but they really formed me. Right. Um, and you did a lot of that uh, international touring with productions with the Worcester Group? Oh, yeah. And we were we were probably sometimes we were three four months out with a show that you put together or built in New York and yep. you take it out yeah and then it got to the point where uh, Europeans would commission work oh yeah and we'd make a piece mm -hmm. and then we'd owe them you know dates uh -huh. and it was a good arrangement because sure. that would keep us going and uh, would also give us deadlines what kind of entities would commission pieces theaters uh, or? theaters yeah. uh, you know public funds. Mm -hmm. Um, because particularly in places like Germany, Belgium, um, uh, some Scandinavian countries, uh -huh. also in Asia, uh, there's either uh, theater festivals yeah, yeah. or there's theaters that get a lot of public money just mm -hmm. to bring stuff from outside as a pleasure to uh sure. because they believe in culture right it's they like believe what, culture what, is it, like education right it's like what turned you on from that guy in in what you saw in milwaukee who brought that stuff there yeah yeah like world theater world yeah. things yep. things from yep. outside yep it's a beautiful yep. thing well when did you start doing the movies um uh, uh 79 i think uh -huh. i mean i had kind of a false start that uh through a series of real complicated things, I was like a glorified extra in Heaven's Gate. <laughs> yeah. So I was on that movie for about three months. Where did that shoot up in the Midwest uh, somewhere? Uh, mostly around Kalispell, Montana. Uh -huh. um, also in Idaho and uh -huh. some other places. Um, but the main first thing was happened to be Catherine Bigelow's first film. Uh -huh. She co-directed it with uh, uh, another guy, uh, with a guy named Monty Montgomery. That was it's a little film called The Loveless. With Robert Gordon. You know it. The rockabilly guy. You know it. I've got his records in the house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, with Robert. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, that was a motorcycle movie. Uh huh. Very stylized. Uh, was it sort of campy? Was it sort of tongue in cheek, or was it she's playing it straight? Pretty straight. Oh yeah. Pretty straight. You know, it was it was more, you know, it was more Kenneth Anger than uh-huh. uh, than Wild One. Right. Got it. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't melodrama. You right. go back to Wild One. Everyone remembers it being pretty cool, but it's yeah. it's pretty funny. Yeah. Now. It's silly. Yeah. Sure. Um, Kenneth Anger. If you looked at him now, you know, Scorpio Rising or. Yeah, it's it's probably little, not funny. No, still, still not funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, but, but the approach is very much about the surface of mm-hmm. things and what we see. So it's, it's very stylized. It's very, you know, I remember it, it ran for a long time as a midnight movie in London and, and its audience was, you know, uh, was really into the kind of fetishism of the, of the leather sure. and these guys yeah. hanging out. And, yeah. That was was it a period piece? It was. Wow! So uh, so that was your first full starring role. Yeah, yeah. And, and I thought this is fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You you yeah. go someplace with a bunch of strangers. You become close really fast. You <laughs> yeah. figure this thing out. Yeah. You have to deal with where you are. Yeah. You've got a basic idea, yeah. and that changes. Yeah. You make it as you're making it. You're changed. Yeah. And you do that, and and then uh, it's and then you have evidence, and you've it. made everything. Yeah, you've <laughs> made you've made something. Yeah, and then that informs the next thing. And is that what informed like one I, step closer to the grave? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the next thing with a flourish. <laughs> that's the ultimate next thing. <laughs> Wait, but is that what got you uh, hooked? Uh, well, not hooked, but I mean, like when what did. Because like Streets of Fire is in, is yeah. another kind of leather adventure in a way. It is, and the funny thing <laughs> is, yeah, yeah, because I had Walter Catherine, Hill in here. Ah, Walter's very cool. Yeah. I, that was a great. That movie was so much fun, and he's he's great. I loved him, and that was a very special movie for me. Walter Hill was friendly with Catherine. And yeah. I think Catherine showed him a little piece of Loveless. Yeah, and. He got the idea to cast me in uh, Streets sure. of Fire, which yeah. was my first Made sense. studio film. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was, and then really out of that, then I started saying more. I got a manager. A woman called me up. I was in the phone book still then. <laughs> yeah, in and, New York. Uh, in New York, and she called me up after seeing The Loveless at a film festival, uh-huh. and she said. Uh, do you want to do some more of this? I think I can help you. <laughs> yeah. So a combination between her, her name was Phyllis Carlisle, uh-huh. and uh, Catherine showing uh, Walter, Walter Hill this yeah. this little piece from The Loveless, uh, that was like the beginning of my yeah the journey professional yeah yeah career. professional film acting career yeah yeah I love that. Well, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember the first time I saw you. I guess it might have been Platoon, but I, I remember being extremely excited about because uh, Friedkin hadn't made a, a movie in a while when To Live and Die in L.A. came out, right? And it when like me and my friend were kind of film heads. We're like, Friedkin's doing a movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Willem Dafoe's in it, and like, in we but, went from, but To Live and Die in L.A. happened before Platoon. Oh, so that was it. Then. Yeah, yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, that I I can't like I was in high school. And uh, and we were thrilled about it, ah, cool. and we're really thinking about it, man. You know what <laughs> I mean? Yeah, that's fair. It it's was a good movie. It's a good movie to think about. I watched it again recently, and it holds up. And I talked to Freakin in here. That was he's great. That that was a hell of a three hour thing. I uh, bet it he's, was great. Yeah, but uh, but like that the, that movie was challenging. I, I I think in some ways because it did. You know, it had a lot of provocative stuff about morality and about... Uh, you know, it's funny because one thing that I remember, and maybe yeah. this may or may not be important, but it was sort of a critical failure initially. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that was fairly consistent in the criticism, and I read criticism in those days, sure, um, was this movie is basically misconceived because there's nobody to relate to because everybody is just awful. Morally, yeah. who do we? the 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 implication was, if you don't have a good guy to root for, 
you can't tell the story. Yeah, what good is which, the movie? Yeah, yeah, which is funny, you know, pre Tarantino and pre many things. But, with, but uh, also like post seventies, there were plenty of anti heroes around. I, I mean, I don't know what they were. It, was the, it must have been the eighties. Yeah, but they kind of uh, yeah. Uh, the sense was they kind of flipped. You right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That's <clears> right. Because if uh, an anti hero in a certain milieu it reads like a hero, that's but this right. This was this was just flat yeah. out <laughs> criminal <laughs> people. Yeah. 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 I mean, they had their reasons. I had this beautiful role of a artist criminal. Yeah, you, good, I think good combination. <laughs> you were the most honest character in some ways. Yeah, in a right? funny way. In a yeah. funny way. Well, I mean, you 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 weren't hiding what you were you know no. doing in the sense. And you're probably out. more fun to have dinner with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Friedkin was that uh, you because I was looking at the you know all the different movies and you've worked with some amazing directors and you've worked with some directors many times. Yeah, and I imagine they all have a different approach and you're a pretty you know uh, you're willing you know, creator, you know, like what is some, what was your relationship with someone like Friedkin? Um, you know, he was, you know, he was the maestro. I think he was a little, you know, he was doing it his own way then yeah. because he was sort of out of the studio system and he thought, well, I'm going to make this film. He found a guy to, you know, put finance up the money, it. Yeah. finance it. Yeah. And they were going to basically, I think they call it fourth wallet, you know, yeah. they were going to put, put in theaters and, uh, it was a very direct, you know, he wanted to keep it simple, direct. Yeah. He wanted actors that nobody had associations with. He didn't want stars because he wanted a grittiness. He wanted for people to, you know, have no out associations outside of right. the movie. Right. So he's the maestro. We're a bunch of wet behind the ear kids. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, playing these worldly heavy guys. <laughs> so, you know, that's where the acting comes in. Was he a hands-on kind of director? Did very you? much. Oh, yeah. Very much, yeah. <laughs> no. He, he, I, no, I, I never knew what to expect. Sometimes, you know, you'd come to the set and he'd say, you know, we're not doing that because I was driving home last night. I saw a really lo cool location uh -huh. and we rewrote this and I found this really interesting guy. So here's the new scene. We're going to shoot this today. Uh huh. He's very fluid. Uh, yeah. you know, very open to That's inspiration. Exciting, very exciting. Yeah. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, I imagine, you know, working like with the type of actor that you were in theater that like it must be exciting. Normal. To me. Yeah. It's normal. Yeah. Too. Right. Now, outside of working with the Worcester group and, and, and being all hands on and, and engaged, did you train at all in any formal way outside of college? Um, not. Not really. Yeah. I mean, uh, mostly by doing. Sure. And even at college, I was. Yeah. You know, I went to I went to university at a time that it was really interesting because I uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee was like a street uh -huh. it was a blue collar right campus. Yeah. It was about you know immigrant kids going to school for the first time. It was about mothers after having kids returning to school. It uh -huh. was about Vietnam veterans coming back. So it didn't have, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't no Yale Drama School. Right. But you had lots of different kinds of people. Yeah. And also the faculty was very eclectic. And I think that really had a stamp on me. Sure. Because, you know, there's no one way. It keeps a flexibility and an appreciation that there's many ways to skin a cat, you yeah, know? Yeah, sure. And, sorry, you love cats. Oh, no, you can um, skin a cat. Okay. <laughs> Metaphorically, uh, I can handle it. Okay. <laughs> That just occurred to me. <laughs> no, no, okay. I'm a big boy. Okay. I take personally. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, that's worth mentioning. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, <clears throat> and, like, I need you to explain a couple of things to me. Uh oh. No, no, I mean, like, well, you did two movies with Oliver Stone. Yep. And Platoon was a, a huge break. For yes. You. That, yes. That, that was a life change. Very important. Yeah. Like, I just turned that movie on the other night and it was in the middle. I was flipping through cable and it was right at the scene where you get shot. Mm -hmm. And it's like one of the most brutal moments in in film and in some weird way mm -hmm. just completely you know that sums up some part of the vietnam yes. experience yeah um and then you did uh, uh, you had a, a, a nice part in born on the fourth of july now working with him it would seem to me that him and freaking in intensity are similar uh yes yeah and 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 when you did very different but similar in intensity right and how how did uh when you were doing platoon uh Entering that world and seeing that script and, and knowing what was going on, what were your feelings, you, you know, about doing it? Um, I was really excited. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you had this guy telling a personal story. Um, you had all these 
Vietnam vets, including Oliver, uh, advising you and training you. Uh, you were playing soldier. You know, yeah. you grow up. I I was born in fifty five, so I grow up with, you know, World War Two movies, yeah. Korean movies, yeah. and then I real also, Vietnam. And then <laughs> you live through Vietnam, yeah. and I'm just old enough. I think my, my year was the last year of the draft. Yeah. Um. So. But this this thing of being a soldier is mm -hmm. part of our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, look yeah. at our look at our military spending. Yes, yeah, you, sure. you can't escape it. And I think, as far as also stories and fantasies, and it's all wrapped up in there. So yeah. the opportunity to play in this story that's personal and lets us kind of tell the story uh, of these people, it, it was thrilling. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a great story. And there was, you know, you hear these things, but it's such camaraderie, and mm -hmm. it was a young cast, you know, that once you got there, Hollywood, it was a million miles away. We were just a bunch of kids playing war and uh, trying to figure stuff out, but guided with this with this story. And was that Berenger? He was. He hadn't done a lot either, had he? No, he was. He was probably. He was the old man of the group, as was far he? as he was. Yeah, he was a well-known actor, and he had done many things. Big Chill, maybe. I, I can't uh, remember. I don't. I don't yeah. know. But he had. He was the most yeah. well-known actor. And it was Sheen and and Charlie Sheen, who was f still fairly new. He's great. And then a lot of movie. A lot of first-time people. Yeah. Uh, and and then he did Born on the Fourth of July, which was an after Vietnam movie. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, but I guess the guy I want you to, to to help me out with because I'm sort of uh, fascinated with him. Yet, and because you've done four movies with him, you must have an understanding of what's compelling and what's, you know, able. Uh, not able, Paul Schrader. Ah, Paul Schrader. I've probably done more than four movies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, he he wrote Taxi Driver. He wrote and and. and He's done many beautiful movies, yeah. and everybody always describes him as the writer of Taxi Driver, which is like... Well, no, I know that, but I've watched his movies, but like, they, you know, the Taxi Driver, I think the reason that, that that's important is that he's able to excavate a certain darkness. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in, in like, when I saw Affliction, you know, I was like, what is going on? Well, that's... Where am I? You got to remember, Affliction comes from a very strong novel, too. Yeah. By Russell Banks. Right. Okay. So that's... Okay. So that's... That's a there. very particular one. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make it any less, <laughs> less anything, but I want to <laughs> point that out. I mean, the ones... Uh, you know, the first time I did something substantial with him was Light Sleep. Yeah. Which was... You know, he was talking about something he knew, mm -hmm. and it was kind of a, a white-collar, you know, drug world of New York. Yeah. And it was thrilling uh, to play that part because it was the kind of part that, you know, that guy could have been me if my life was different. Sure. And also, I shot very little in New York, and it was a very uh, naturalistic in its style for yeah. the most part, and it was really fun to... Uh, play genteel uh drug dealer uh -huh. for a while yeah um a guy that was searching yeah and it it was a role that hit me at the right time and it meant a lot to me um but his style is very um a little distant uh you know i think he schrader yeah he deals with very hot things in a very cool way yeah and i like that yeah because it makes them burn all the hotter yeah, you know? yeah. well i think autofocus is like a masterpiece <laughs> oh good autofocus is fun oh uh, that was God. really fun and you know that's not a widely seen f film no. but yeah paul has a good nose he really is good at smelling what's in the air you know i thought his his uh his sort did of did you see dog eat dog recently i didn't know i gotta see it i i didn't know about it yeah and when was that that's a little wacky yeah two years ago with nick cage yeah yeah. I haven't seen him do something, you know, out I, I just haven't seen him lately. <laughs> uh, uh, Nick was Cage, yeah. Nick, oh, he works all the time. Yeah, but he does big weird kind of franchise movies sometimes. For he me, does. And I, I mean, don't see a lot of the little ones. I didn't see the second Bad Lieutenant. Were you uh, in that as well? No, no. Oh. But yeah, how is he doing? Nick he, Cage. He seems good. Yeah. He seems good. You know, I think he wants to find you know, he appreciates the tentpole movies and and uh you know, he's still very bankable, but yeah. um I think he still l wants to do weird movies. Uh, yeah, that's one movies. way of saying it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
but uh but like with the autofocus that uh, you know i saw it a couple times uh, when it came out and his sort of like uh that preoccupation with equipment yeah yeah i thought it was pretty fascinating yeah and also it was i love movies and like this movie that you know i'm kind of talking about a lot now florida yeah, Project. yeah i love that movie um the th- cool thing about autofocus is the making of the film had such parallels to the film itself, you know? The way we made it informed things so much because we were making this in the shadow of Hollywood on a shoestring budget yeah. about some guys with this, you know, and... and, and Video. You know, and we're hiring, we're hiring these girls, you know? I, I don't know. There was something... And it wasn't it was a reflection. Real, yeah, yeah. It a, was it was really fun. A dark <laughs> yeah, reflection. We really were, we're able to inhabit uh, this world because we were living it in right, a, right. in, in, a, in yeah. a parallel way. Yeah, in that scene, like the 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 sort of like there, there's a moment in that movie that I just will that where everything is just broken down to a degree where you're just consumed by this compulsion, the sex yeah. addiction. There. Yeah. But it's just you and Kinnear on that couch, just both of you jerking off on opposite ends of the couch, <laughs> just sharing a memory. Okay. I, you know that, but you know that moment with the casualness of it, <laughs> where you know where you're in something that that is that bizarre, and and that it, that it's become commonplace. It's normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, I just think that's a, a, a fun scene for some reason. Yeah. And then, no, that was a fun movie. <laughs> I, I enjoy working with Paul. Is he a dark guy on set? Uh, no, he's a happy guy on set oh, he because he likes to work, oh, but yeah. he's the dark guy in general. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he's serious. And Abel Ferrara, you, how many movies did you do with him? Five, I think, and I'm going to make some more. How's he doing? He's doing great. You yeah. Know? He's, 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 ni- has a nice, clean lifestyle, a new baby. I'm, oh, good. I'm the godfather to his child. Oh, that's great. Um, he's my neighbor in Rome. Um, what is it about his vision that you like so much? I don't know about his vision. I like him. Yeah. And he How he, he also movies. encourages the way we work. I, I really feel like a collaborator, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and the sad thing is he he's not widely distribu- uh, distributed yeah. here. So people are really ignorant of a movie like Pasolini. It doesn't even, isn't, isn't I don't, even I haven't present seen it. here. Yeah. I, there's some, a, lot, a few of your movies I wanted to watch I can't find. The Lars, it's very different. The Van, Lars Van Trier stuff is not on iTunes? That's ridiculous. I couldn't find Antichrist. That's ridiculous. Right? We're living in a very puritanical country. I, I want, I, I, or that might be a corporate issue, but maybe it is. Right. It is, but the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they're the hand of the... Yeah. They're the instrument of... Um, Oh, yeah. Keeping the machine going. But with Pasolini, that shouldn't be the issue. That's just bad distribution, huh? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Hmm. I mean, you know, you hate to complain, you know? Right, sure. But the truth is, it's really a mystery to me. Because even even from a pure, grubby com- commerce standpoint, if you put that on some platform, you know, one yeah. of these video uh, on-demand platforms, uh-huh. any gay kid that's in Iowa someplace and feels like he can't connect with, you know, uh, icons of of a, a certain kind of culture or yeah. uh, that express certain things, uh, you know, should be able to see that movie. Yeah, And absolutely. there's enough out there. And besides uh, that, uh, Pasolini was such a um, brilliant thinker. And whether you like the movie or not, there is enough expression of what he did in the movie yeah. that it's <laughs> going to be worth it. And then you can go see his work. Exactly. And it inspire you to see his exactly. work. Exactly. Well, hopefully maybe people listening will get out there. I, I mean, I want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm also a big fan of Mississippi Burning. Obviously, you know, I could go through all your movies. Okay. You're a little top heavy on the front. So obviously, you know, you can always tell uh, where people watch movies and where they stop working, watching them less. Well, I, let's see. I just didn't get or, down the list. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Cry Baby, Wild at Heart. I saw. Oh, the, no, uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I shouldn't bust the right. balls, but you get it. Yeah, sure, I do. But I and because I because what happens film. is when people are young, yeah. they have more time. Sure, they're going out, and film was placed in our culture a little differently. That's right. And now, when it's harder to find, sometimes certain kinds of movies, yeah, you got to be a cinephile. You got, and also you got to go. 
Yeah. You can't watch them easily. Like, yeah. I, I didn't see the Von Trier films, either of them, and I'm upset about it because I missed the window. Ah, oh, you got to see Antichrist. I do got to see it. That Was that a, a challenging, amazing thing for you? I just think it's a beautiful movie, and yeah. it's not what people think it is. Well, um, I, I, I think it's not for everyone, but yeah. I think he has such a nose for exploring the um, unspeakable, uh-huh. you know, really taboos in a constructive way. And he always gets labeled as just being transgressive and kind of a trickster and, you know. But I think he's he, there's something in his character that he really knows how to... Um, you know, look under the rocks. Sure. And and he's a great filmmaker. I mean, there's some some images and some sequences in that that, for me, are, are like incredibly beautiful. Yeah, I, I I. But it's rough too. So I I okay. get it when someone says, "Oh, I can't take it." I think I can handle it. Yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Was he? Is he? The, he's part of the dogma filmmakers, right? Yeah, I mean, he was one of the, the main guy, guys. Yeah. But I think you know that was a period of time. Well, yeah, because I saw Everything another one, uh, the celebration. Shifts. I saw, and I don't yeah. think he directed that one, but it was no, no. That, that was a that was a hell of a movie that yeah. dealt with some of the same taboos. Yep. It's pretty wild. Shadow Vampire, very good. Great. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, 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 and I, you know, I, I think you're pretty good in everything. Personally, good. I'm a fan. Okay. Good. But yeah, you work with Cronenberg too, which yeah. must have been interesting. I yeah, saw no, that movie. I, That's not an easy movie great. to find. Right. Existence. Right. I don't even know if it's a. If it's a favorite of Cronenberg's, I don't know. He's a very controlled dude, man. Like he knows. Exactly. No, and his sets are beautiful. Yeah, it's really fun to work with him because he, he feels like not unlike uh, I, I imagine. I don't know Wes Anderson. Very a little control, bit. He's, controlled. He environment. sees it. He yeah. sees it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a he lot of wiggle it. room. Yeah, but you'd be surprised. Yeah, you know the irony is when when you have a good structure yeah. and it's seen, the wiggle room is inside. Oh, <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you're free, uh-huh. and you don't lose a certain kind of energy or have a certain kind of anxiety. It's like you can focus better, and you can go deeper, because yeah. you're not... There's a security, but at the same time, the security, you got to punch out, you know? I get it. So, like, you know, they know what their work has, like, kind of you know, left you only so many choices around their work, yep. but your work... Well, it's it's like if... <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's it is about choices yeah. and about where to direct your energy. Yeah. And if it's articulated, then you have to work in a more focused way in a a, a clearer uh-huh. field uh-huh. rather than having an old whole field and kind of be have this gun to your head to right. uh, be clever or invent or interpret. Uh-huh. You don't worry about that. Yeah. When you've got a, a strong language and a strong structure, yeah. then you're just trying to survive and live and keep it alive. And R- somehow in that, that's where you become engaged. Right. Because you aren't... You aren't it's not it, it becomes you. practical. Right. Yeah, you lose yourself. Yeah. You lose yourself and deeply... You connect with yourself more because you throw away a lot of the surface things of identity and and thought, and you get to a more intuitive state, a state that you didn't even know you had, mm. because you're kind of putting a you're putting a corner, yeah, yeah. and you got to figure it out, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, in the moment, yeah. Well, how how did that apply to the Florida project? It looked like that was a little looser than obviously. Uh, a Cronenberg or, or an Anderson film, but it was one place. Um, yeah. Uh, the Florida Project was beautiful because you, uh, the Sean Baker is really great at using concrete, real elements and yeah. mixing fictional elements or designed elements in them, uh, with them. Uh-huh. And they started out with a, a really strong screenplay. You and were, and- I, I, from Sean and uh, his... Writing partner, Chris Bergash. And that's what you got first? You, you Yeah, and it was beautiful. And you could shoot that. And we did shoot that. But we also shot other stuff. Yeah. And sometimes also there would be alter, alternate takes. Sure. Or with the children, there's, there's a lot of kids in this movie. And they're, they're children, not actors. They're, well, they're children first, that, let's say. And they were great. And they were great. Um, particularly the central girl. The girl she's yeah. six years old and she's a natural. Yeah. You know, she's a little... Uh, firecracker yeah um what i'm saying is that you can have both yeah sure and and when you have a structure that can let you you know that can make you a little looser 
Mm-hmm. That's the irony. If you're spending too much time looking for that structure, mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, no, but it was interesting because watching you, that you know, when you your your presence was there all the time. Well, I had a very clear job. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know, were the manager of the hotel. I ma- yeah, and that's what I did. <laughs> what did I do? Yeah. I managed this motel. <laughs> yeah, and we were shooting a movie there. Yeah, and it was like the the I love it when the you know the line between real life agreed on life uh-huh. you know yeah uh, uh communally accepted reality yeah gets thrown out for our special reality like the manager would be sitting there and we'd have to shoot a scene in the office and they'd like okay can you guys step out we'll go in you know oh so that and was like that that a was a little bit like that so there were and, people who living at that hotel oh yeah it yeah. was a functioning motel yeah and and um sometimes We'd be in the middle of scene and people would come to check in. Yeah. And we weren't a big crew. Right. It was a very small crew. Yeah. So it's like, don't go in there. Don't go in there. We're shooting. You know, <laughs> it's not like we had lots of equipment trucks. Right. But everybody's on hands on deck with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah. I- and then you've got kids running around. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, people with real challenging lives, you know, coming out to mm-hmm. see the circuses. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was really... How did that affect really your, your, you feel like, how did it affect your performance being in the presence of, you know, what was real destitution and, and real desperation? It keeps it, you honest. Yeah, yeah. You don't make a bullshit movie. You've right. got to honor those people. Yeah. And you aren't, they don't become, they stop being those people and they become your people. Yeah. Because you're one of them. Right. Just by sheer proximity. Mm-hmm. You're talking to them. They're telling you stories. That informs everything. Mm-hmm. You know, you're down with them. Yeah. And it may be temporary, and you have no illusion, you know, you know, uh, it's a tough world. Sure. Because, uh, this world that we're talking about for people that haven't seen the movie is a world of people living in uh, low-cost motels in uh, an area in central Florida near the uh, amusement parks. Uh that don't have permanent residences. So they're long time, long term temporary residences in these motels. And it's the kind of Kmart thing that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, they pay as they go. You know, the old, you know, when someone doesn't have a lot of money, they go to Kmart, they say, wow, I can get a grill for 20 bucks. Well, they end up buying 20 grills over their lifetime. And that mm-hmm. grill lasts about two months it yeah. goes in the landfill yeah. and next year they have to buy it again if they bought a nice grill in the first place right then they'd have some stability they'd pay uh, a fraction as much and you wouldn't have many grills in the landfill right so we're really you know we're 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 a dog chasing its own tail sure, you know sure and this expresses that cycle yeah. a little bit yeah um because it's a very precarious position because they, they have trouble after the, a, a little bit of the crash and the housing crisis. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, um, you know, can't find a place to live because they can't afford the, uh, the first, uh, the down payment mm-hmm. or they can't do the security checks or they can't do the, uh, yeah. Yeah, they can't. They they've fallen out. Yeah, they've yeah. fallen out. They, they slipped fa- through. And and yeah, and I thought it was fascinating because you know the the kids, the energy of the kids, is is what buoys you know the 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 emotional tone of that movie. Oh yeah, it's you know the kids are very present, and you see kind of a joyful right. uh, chaos of the kids. Yeah, but then you have this shadow of the yeah. difficulty of the adults, and you kind of see a life, uh-huh. and that's. What appeals to me uh, about it, it, without wagging fingers or or even necessarily giving a solution, that's right. it it just just shows a world uh, that's in kind of trapped in a loop. Yeah, and and, at uh, the, and it's interesting at the end, you know, because your character is inter- it, it be, it, You know, about midway through, you start to realize, like, well, this guy's, you know, I don't know what it is, but he's 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 been compromised somehow. That, Who hasn't? No, no, I'm not. That's I'm, the point. It's not a judgment. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. I mean, that's sort of the point. Well, the, but it's and, like it's not overplayed. You don't even know what it is. I imagine that guy oh. helping you move was your son, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like I, I don't know what happened here. Yeah, but yeah. this is where he ended up. Yep, yep. And he's only one tier above the people. That's, only in the sense that he's got a job is the only difference between him and the people living there. That's absolutely right, and I, I think that's why this isn't. You know, this is not uh, uh, 
it's a small movie, but it's not a depressing movie, and it's not it's a, a limited movie, yeah. because it points to this impulse that we have to try try to make good of a limited situation. Yeah. And it's it's that that balance that we try to do between acceptance, but also forging ahead, trying to make it better. And Bobby, my character is. Uh, you know, without telling people before they see the movie too much, but he's he's a simple guy. Yeah. You know, he's there's nothing on the surface yeah. extraordinary about him. Yeah, and but he he makes stuff work somehow because he's good hearted and he 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 the big thing the big takeaway really for me is not judgmental. No, he recognizes that your happiness, my happiness, is dependent on your mm-hmm. happiness which is a very important equation to learn that we all know, but we don't get a chance to practice very mm-hmm. often because we're, we're bred on competition, get ahead of the other guy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if he falls behind, that gives you more room to go ahead, you know, and it's really about cooperation and compassion and, and helping each other. I, it, I tell you, the movie, like, it, it felt to me a, a little like some of those movies made in – about kids in in sort of like uh, Latin American movies mm-hmm. uh, and some of the I I don't I don't remember titles. No, I like Pichote or something. Pichote, right? Like that. There's these you know these sort of these kids living in poverty in these third world countries, and now you and they're you know, doing great. Yeah, but you know it's not going to last forever. Oh no! And then it, now this is an American version of that. That yeah, I, I haven't that's really. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, it felt that way to me that, you know, the joy and relentless exuberance of these kids are the only thing that makes us not a depressing movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but also my guy. Your you know, guy too. You right. can I identify with him because that he's, oh, he's definitely. an everyman. And even the woman who plays the mother, you, you know, you're rooting for her on some level. It, it's all very compelling and it isn't sa- It's sad, but it's not depressing. But at the end of the movie, you're confronted with some interesting things in yourself. And yep. I don't want to give away yep. much. Right, right. No, it's I, Sean has done a beautiful job. No doubt. Um, it's very balanced and and it's. I didn't see the first it, one. It's either. complete. It's yeah. It's, it's complete and whole. Yes. But it's not closed. That's right. It's got plenty of room for the audience to participate. Yeah. That always sounds like a lot of work when you say that to people, but it's a pleasure. I think. Well, I like those kind of movies where, you know, it is open enough for, for it to challenge a person's individual sensibility without, you, you know, you're not, it's not a closed system. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and what are you working on now? You, you doing something? I just got here. I just wrapped on a film called Aquaman. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is and, it a superhero movie? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. James Wan directing, Jason Momoa, yeah. Amber Heard. What are you doing? Uh, Patrick Wilson. I play a good character. I, I play a character that's kind of the mentor to Aquaman. Uh-huh. He's also a politician that is the kind of the Lord Chamberlain or the, the guy to uh, Patrick Wilson, who is the, the king. Uh-huh. Um, Interesting. Yeah, there'll be plenty of time to talk about that. But that just finished that. James Wan, yeah. a great director. Oh, good. Uh, big movie, yeah. big muscular fun movie. And what? And you did the Orient Express? Is it, I did the Orient is Express. Is that a remake? It's a, a third uh, one. I don't know what they call them: reboots, <laughs> remakes, refiguring, reimagining. But uh, Kenneth Branagh, uh, uh, an incredible, a uh, nutty lead. He directed it. Yeah. Oh. Wow. And he stars as Poirot. Oh, okay. And uh, it's a fantastic cast. Very uh-huh. stylish, great script. I I haven't seen it yet, but it mm. was really fun to do. And then now I'm off to France to uh, do a film with Julian Schnabel. Another one. He did, uh, which one did he? Basquiat. He, he did Basquiat. He did uh, uh, Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Oh, yeah. He did. Diving I was Bell? in, I was did a little cameo in Basquiat. I was in Morale, uh-huh. which was his last one. I like Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And he also did uh, Before Night Falls, which is a beautiful oh, yeah, film yeah, 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 that yeah. Javier Bardem yeah, was yeah, so yeah. good in. That's a good movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I liked his paintings, too. Yeah, he's a great artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He and he's fun to work with. Yeah. I've, in film, I've only worked with him in very small ways because uh-huh. we know each other. Um, so this is friends. a big way. Is this going to be a big? This one? is a big way. Big, no, it's not a big movie. It's a smaller movie, but but it's a beautiful. It's Van Gogh at the end of his life. Oh wow! You know, at mm. the at the period where he was really most productive, but also most challenged. Mm. Let's say. Yeah. And so you're Van Gogh. I'm playing Van Gogh. And what do you do to prepare for that? Right now, I'm growing my beard. 
Yeah. Learn how to paint. Uh huh. You do he read the to... letters between him and his brother and Theo. Uh, read a life. Uh huh. Uh, you know this very well researched biography. Mm -hmm. But also, Julian leads the way because one of the beautiful things about Julian is, like all great directors, you know when you come down to it, it's like you got a room. You bring stuff into the room yeah. that means something to you uh -huh. or resonate with you or sig signify something for you. And then you order it. You make a relationship, and that relationship and what happens kind of makes its own story. Everybody's mm -hmm. story, 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 um, you know, expressing your point of view or, you know, uh, explaining. Yeah. The best things always happen when you're able to tap into this kind of process of making something. Yeah. And someone like Julian understands that so deeply. That's why when he started making movies, then everybody said, my God, he's a filmmaker. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's a little bit like, duh. Yeah, of course he is. Yeah, of course he is. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, I'm, I am I bring that up. There's plenty of time to talk about that too, sure, but I'm sure. excited. I, I leave in a, you know, a, a That's couple great. of couple of days and you yeah. spend and you, you live almost exclusively in rome now no I, I well you know i work a lot so i live in rome and new york mm -hmm. but i lately a little bit more in rome that must be nice it's a beautiful place yeah. i mean you know they're they've got their challenges but speaking i time? call me foolish yeah <laughs> see yeah. i'll just answer that <laughs> <laughs> enough <laughs> yeah i i have to study every day oh yeah yeah, yeah. well you look great, and, you, and you're doing great work, and it was a, a, a thrill to talk to you. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, that was me and Mr. Defoe. It was great talking to him. Good meeting him. And don't forget, if you love listening to music like I do, you really should be listening on a Sonos speaker system. Whether curated or on demand, free or subscription-based, Sonos has you covered with access to a growing list of music services in any room or every room at once. And for a limited time, Sonos is offering the listeners of WTF with Mark Marin 10% off one order of $2,500 or less for any product on Sonos.com. Just use the promo code WTF10, that's capital WTF10, at Sonos.com to receive this offer. It's nice out here. I'll play some guitar. I'll play some redundant guitar on my gold guitar and my old ass amp. <laughs> Boomer lives!